We've been debating Star Wars as long as there's been Star Wars, and I wanted to know how Star Wars was seen by us to us as a species. Star Wars is the juggernaut in any film conversation. It's so big it can't be one thing anymore. Every film in the mainline series is someone on planet Earth's favorite thing ever made. Every single film is somebody's favorite for their reasons, different reasons. It's an odd thing researching how historical things were received at the time of their release. The easiest thing is to look up critical reviews and cherry pick things from there, but you don't get a hold of the emotion of a situation, how it made people, everyone, feel. And I want to begin that conversation with the most important familial connection in Star Wars as it being the forever most relevant. And I think we need to update our collective value of the surprise of Vader being Luke's father. That was a smaller story from a long time ago in an Earth right here. That fact is allowed to be upsetting, but entertainment grows and expands to satisfy the largest number of people. When stuff gets popular, as it is a business, we get more of it. And the smaller stories of yesterday just dilute in value because we're adding a lot of volume to the proverbial Star Wars bucket. Again, you can be mad about that because you liked Star Wars when it was this smaller personal thing that didn't cater to more people. The larger Star Wars gets, the more satisfied people there are on planet Earth cheering against that result is sad. The backstory, not the story of Star Wars. Now apply that example to whatever your favorite thing about Star Wars is. People have no doubt watched these films so out of order it would take a lot of us on a bar -fluge. And I bet a lot of those people love something about Star Wars that we never would have considered. It's not a popular thing, it's THE popular thing. And I thought it would be a fun and valuable exercise to retrace our steps from the beginning to right now. How did people, critics, and fans alike react to all of the movies? The results are pretty head-turning, so let's just go for it. Certainly the chillest of Star Wars movies, and definitely its own thing, that was originally just called Star Wars. I mean, once there's the Pirates of the Caribbean dead man's chest, the meaning of the Black Pearl changes. Though the fact they had the foresight to put a subtitle on the first movie shows you that Disney was always imagining that as a franchise, even if no one else was. God, no one else was. A New Hope was just the first form we ever saw of Star Wars. It gave us a wicked slice of a universe that no one had ever seen. In 1977, Gary Arnold, writing for the Washington Post, said, George Lucas has made the kind of sci-fi adventure movie you dream about finding, for your own pleasure as well as your kids. However, and quite famously, Pauline Kael of The New Yorker wrote, Oh, dull new world. We are treated to a galactic civil war. Assorted heroes and villains, a princely maiden in distress, a splendid old man surviving from an extinct order of knights who possessed a mysterious power called the Force. And it is all as exciting as last year's weather reports. Turn down for what? Polly Barcha! Yeah! Whoo! After a long history of saying super smart things, Roger Ebert said this super smart thing in his original 1977 review. The most fascinating single scene for me was the one in the bizarre saloon on the planet Tatooine. As the incredible collection of extraterrestrial alcoholics and bug-eyed martini drinkers lined up at the bar, and as Lucas so slyly let them exhibit characteristics that were universally human. And on the flip thumb, going to Gene Siskel with quotes that people would probably like to forget, he said, Save for Alec Guinness, the cast is unmemorable. To take a quick step back from the critics, people went 
kickflip bananas for this thing. It practically created the idea of people going to the theater again and again for repeated viewings. It was a huge visual blockbuster. People went on record saying they saw it as many as 16 times. It was an experience they wanted to relive, not just a movie. People of all ages loved it. A lot of critics picked up the fact that Star Wars was a throwback serial homage and more than just having an opening title crawl and a big space opera, it was kind of cheesy in the right ways. It was looked at and loved once upon a time for being this small, scrappy Flash Gordon on steroids kind of thing. And that is really George Lucas's move. And it's a very strong move, the old serial thing. And critically, it was a touch mixed. Joy Gold Boyum of the Wall Street Journal said, There's something depressing about seeing all these impressive cinematic gifts. All these extraordinary technological skills lavished on such puerile materials. We enjoyed such stuff as children, but one would think there would come a time when we might put away childish things. Damn. Damn. And on the fun emergency quick joy side of the spectrum, because we got a lot of these to get through, NPR called it splendibulous, a word they made up for how this movie made them feel, which is the most NPR thing to do. And moving on. Gonna lean a bit more on the public reception in this section because uh, in one word it is fascinating. Muggles were kind of stressed out by Han getting together with Leia and not Luke. Let's be fair, they didn't know yet. It's fascinating to see how unequivocally this is widely remembered as the best, most flawlessest one. Is that the word? Fla flawlessest? Word on this film from everyone was... Laugh it up, fuzzball. I mean, it was pretty mixed. Something that happens with, wait for it, every Star Wars film. Uh, let's start with the Washington Post. The Empire Strikes Back has no plot structure, no character studies, let alone character development, no emotional or philosophical point to make. It has no original vision of the future, which is depicted as a pastiche of other junk culture formula, such as the Western, the costume epic, and the World War II movie. Its specialty is special effects or visual tricks, some of which are playful, imaginative, and impressive, but others of which have become space movie cliches. Um, pays for his past sins in a way that is not only devastating to the character in the story, but also to the structure of the narrative at large, as it was left unresolved going forward. I mean, people didn't know how this resolved for, for three more years. So the audience felt that for three years. But no, yeah, not nothing feels, not, nothing? Here's a strange wrinkle. Um, people were super miffed that the love triangle was resolved uh, so quickly in only the second film and not the third one as expected. And it's easy to see why without the third piece, Luke is the brother of the princess, you got a real Jacob Edward thing that resolved almost immediately. And there were Luke Leia shippers and Han Leia shippers back then. And yes, they got very cross with one another. Like I said, what is common knowledge changes and evolves with the films. We once lived in a world where people put undue pressure on who the stone cold badass was going to pick. Hey, wait a minute. And this scene, I love you, I know, had some bitter aftertaste for a lot of people, like really bitter. People were mad because their fan theories got trampled on. And the curveball of Anakin Skywalker being alive and, hi, I'm evil, I'm also your dad, and that didn't go over great with a large part of the audience. Starlog, an unfortunately named sci-fi magazine at the time, printed fan reactions to the movie. Here's one from Robert L. Beatty Scarola. Is Luke related to Vader? Most think so now that Vader came out and said it. Well, I say, do you believe everything you hear? Vader may have just lied to enl enlist Luke in... Okay, fan theories have always been there, writing themselves into tighter and tighter corners. Got stories to tell you. And they actually didn't have to wait until Return of the Jedi to get their dreams ruined, as David Prowse, Darth Vader's body himself, confirmed in a college yearbook. Yeah, a college yearbook for your exclusives back then. He said, I am Luke Skywalker's father. 
just immediately crushed those dreams, and there were sad trombones everywhere. Plus, Yoda dropped the whole no, there is another thing. Oops. A lot of people thought and speculated for years that Luke was getting a badass ninja Jedi love interest who dunked on the bad guys with righteous force powers. They were a little upset uh, by the, the Leia thing, whose badass force powers were not actually realized on screen until episode 8, so there's a nice little connector there. 8 paid off stuff set up in uh, Empire. Yeah. Is it so hard to put ourselves in the shoes of someone, even ourselves, who was so curious about those mysteries it occupied our every thought? The fan theories about romances, the speculation about the answers to mysterious questions, it was all there, and a lot of people didn't like the answers. And then came Ewoks. Oh my goodness. But in some places, including Ottawa, a privileged few got to see it last night, and in the Ottawa audience was 11-year-old Justin Trudeau. Justin. How did you like the movie? Great. Was it, the best was one, it? it was better than The Empire Strikes Back in Star Wars. At least I think so. Return of the Jedi was big. Huge. At the end of 1983, the top three films of all time were E.T., Star Wars, and Return of the Jedi. E.T. was in and of itself a blockbuster of a whole different flavor, but Star Wars beat Jedi by one spot and it had a six year head start on it. Jedi was huge. Jedi was the confirmation that the blockbuster was there to stay. Roger Ebert was glowing about it, saying, It's a little amazing how Lucas and his associates keep topping themselves. Which can be taken in a lot of ways, but as you'll see, people were pretty hyped up about Jedi when it came out. It gave everything a happy ending, unlike Empire. So everyone left the theater happy, unlike Empire. There's something important to talk about with Jedi at the release too. There was a lot of chatter, which came originally from things Lucas himself said, that we were gonna get a nine movie saga. Like it shows up in a, in a staggering amount of pieces about this. Here's one, Leonard Malton. For the new film, the former flair and invention are lacking. Don't go to Malton. Making the prospect of two more trilogies planned on the same lines very daunting. He later gave The Phantom Menace three stars. The Hollywood Reporter also mentioned the nonology. It was expected. Here's my point. Yours, mine, everyone's obsession, everyone's opinions on Star Wars as a thing are constantly evolving, you know, like life. From the BBC, the somber, complex tone of The Empire Strikes Back is discarded in favor of a simpler, episodic approach. And that's from a 4 out of 5 star review they gave Empire 5, which are sentiments that seem to line up with a lot of what I read about this. Going back to Ebert for a second, I thought this quote was super interesting. If George Lucas persists in his plans to make nine Star Wars movies, this will nevertheless be the last we'll see of Luke, Han, and Leia, although the robots will be present in all the films. And that is a prescient thing to say in 1983 and be that accurate. Luke, Han, and Leia were only seen again once someone other than George was in control of it. And the robots are in every single film. Damn, Ebert, you still best in the game. And to close this out and move on, I think it's important to mention that the narrative critically about Star Wars was that they got better every single time. So on the whole, Jedi was well received by eager, if not exhausted critics, and fans were happy with it. Safer moves tend to be received better on the whole by more people than the movies that take bigger risks with the franchise. But after being pretty pissed at Empire, it calmed a lot of people down to understand why some of their theories didn't come true. It's easy to say now that Jedi is the weakest of the original trilogy because it was the safest one that took the least chances. But when you see it in context that there was a pushback that would lead a creative team to do something more safe, I mean, that's fascinating. People dug Jedi. It wasn't controversial. Oh, what, what's that? I oh, think that would make a pretty good segue into... I feel like I'm sitting down to narrate a Ken Burns documentary. 
History did not look back kindly on the Phantom Menace and one excited young soldier named Jaja Binks took heed of the call to battle. But at the time, there was such a collection of energy heading into the 1999 premiere that no film could possibly stand contra to that avalanche of hype. And hype it did. <laughs> These are so positive. It's ludicrous. Danny Graydon of the BBC, by no means the feared anticlimactic disappointment episode one vitally succeeds in holding its own against the legions of blockbusters Star Wars was responsible for. It's an often deliriously exciting adventure hitting the target audience of 10 year olds and satisfying longtime fans, providing the pop culture analysis is discarded. The New York Times, stripped of hype and breathless expectations, Mr. Lucas's first installment offers a happy surprise. It's up to snuff. It sustains the gee whiz spirit of the series and offers a swashbuckling extra galactic getaway, creating illusions that are even more plausible than the kitchen raiding raptors of Jurassic Park. Come on! Rolling Stone, comic relief, and boy does this movie need it, arrives with scene stealer Jar Jar Binks. To be fair, that was Peter Travers, and he does acknowledge the movie is a little on the slow, arduous Trade Federation dispute sock hop side of things, but also he's Peter Travers. SFX Magazine. This film is undeniably spectacular. Total Film Magazine. This is a fun movie that only dedicated Star Wars haters will fail to enjoy on some level. But not to be outdone because Peter wants to get on that poster because that's what Peter do. Of the film, I can say many things, but the long and short of it is that I liked it quite a bit. I'd rank it right after Empire. Hey, speaking of Empire, Empire Magazine put it on their list of 500 greatest movies of all time. And on the fan side of things, there was one fairly instantaneous grievance and a severe one, one that soured word of mouth on this film in about a week. And I didn't see this mentioned in the reviews I read, and that's midichlorians. Obviously, the public critiques against aspects of this film increased, but at the outset, every negative against this film was really about midichlorians and Jar Jar Binks. We love the pod race, and we love the ending fight scene with Darth Maul, and both those things were enough to keep us talking about it for at least a couple weeks. And part of the aim of this piece is to not cast aspersions at any one position, but to look at everything collectively. And collectively, one thing that angers fans seemingly every time is when Star Wars changes. And episode one made a categorically huge change that put critic and fan on two very different sides of the aisle. And super disclaimer, I'm not here to defend midichlorians, which stand head and shoulders above all other alterations to the canon as the one that manages to be so bad that it worked its way back out of the canon like a splinter. We're still working that one out of our systems today, which quickly became the sticking point more so than even Han shooting first, though that memory was fresh in our minds as the cracks in the George Lucas fresco painting had begun to show thanks to the special editions that came out two years prior to this. Like, who changes the fabric of their movie universe like that? That's a fundamental change to a character that had existed for decades in one way. Now, the world, sadly, was a little used to George Lucas making them mad, parents who grew up on the original trilogy suddenly couldn't tell their kids they could be Jedis when they grew up because they might not have a high enough science number of microscopic space wizards living in their blood. I mean, parents lied to their children about midichlorians, and if episode one proved anything, it was that Star Wars was fallible. What's up, David McIntyre, Matt Hessinger, Alex Podgorski, Robert Mock, Brett Brizzy going too fast from a prompter. It's not a prompter, it's just my other monitor. It's just a second monitor. I just like to pretend it's a teleprompter. What's up, Iris Fox, Ryan Schaefer, Glenn White, Sandy Lester, Lil V, Kips Stroll. Let's talk about, well, what I originally thought was going to be 
uh, a week to make the second half of this because I've already written a bit, though I'm I I now have a lot of ideas for what to to follow this up with. Um, I'm gonna give myself the full two weeks to make the next episode because uh, I'm gonna need it uh, to not go uh, insane. So. New episode two weeks, then hopefully two weeks after that, we'll jump into stuff that's not Star Wars for a while, but we'll have to see. Uh, what's up, John Erickson, Austin McKinley, Damian Eggleston, Amy B, Mike Fielding, Adam Muto, Chris Cable, Tracy Jones, Kevin Kelly, Time Jumper 319. I just like saying the names. Thank you all so much for your Patreon support. If you'd like to support me, go to patreon.com slash Mikey, which soon will probably be film joy, God willing. We're working on it. Uh, Douglas Doucette, Criterion Correction Podcast, Benedict the Mad, Michelle and Greppo, Scott Gibson, Stephen Hillman, Chris Hinosa, Pat Rothfuss, Tom Lynch, Thomas McCoy, Victoria Studley. I just I'm gonna keep going if I don't if I don't stop myself. Uh, yeah, this was the first week of the new stuff um, where I I take less of a focus on individual movies and just talk about a lot of stuff. Uh, as it relates to how how we see film and how we build films in America and across the rest of the world. Just like Mike Laidlaw. That's not true. I just thought I'd call out. Actually, that is, tr- that is true of Amy Berg uh, and a bunch of other people on those, this list. So I don't know what that means. Um, go watch Counterpart on Stars. That's what that means. I am so off track. Benjamin A. Straub, Henry Croft, Terry Mesnard, Walter Craigie, Kelly Naylor, Richard Scott, Adam Thomas, Trey Warren, Ray Johnson, Patrick Mahoney, Brad Hunziker. I, you, you just, you, you have to fill three minutes of, of credits. And that's just the top tier of the Patreon. You guys are awesome. Like Kevin Hochter, Chris Madsen, Garrett Lathy, Cyclops, Boy, Stephen Morton, Jason M. Klug, Jacob Kozil Koz, I'm bad. I'm fired. Map. See, I got map right. Uh, I will see you guys in two weeks with How We See Star Wars Episode 2. Please tip your waitresses. <laughs>